Hello colleagues and welcome to this lunchtime session. It's our 12.10 till 12.40 Real School Stories. Today the session is called Closing the Attainment Gap One Lesson at a Time. The session is hosted by my tutor and has a number of illustrious speakers including Nima Abdullah who is Assistant Head Teacher for the Quality of Education, the City of Leicester College, Gary Green, Director of Improvement and Development from the Bohunt Education Trust and Sophie George who's a Senior Education partnerships manager at my tutor and I will say as someone who was a governor until very recently at a school that was also uh, using very similar strategies to what you're going to hear about today I have listened to these kind of talks before and they are always inspirational practical and useful so you're in for a real treat please give a round of applause to the panelists and off you go Hello everyone, um, thank you so much for coming to our session this afternoon on closing the attainment gap one lesson at a time. Uh, we're my tutor, so we're a live online tutoring platform working with over 1300 schools now nationwide um, to provide life changing online tutoring for people who really do need it most. Um, but I'm not going to do a pitch, I'm here to introduce two of our fantastic school and trust partners who are going to talk to you about how they're using our platform as but one of the ways um, to help close the attainment gap in their schools. Um, a vital topic, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, so please join me in welcoming Nima first and then Gary. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, thank you so much. Yeah, brilliant. Just going to swap over to the mic. Well, I hope you can all hear me. Yep, perfect. Hi, I'm Nima Abdullah. I am an assistant head teacher at the City of Leicester College. Now, my role, like most senior leaders, encompasses quite a lot. So, on a day to day basis, it feels like my job is being a lollipop lady and a glorified dinner lady at lunchtime. But in actual fact, my role focuses on the quality of education and I oversee things like literacy, numeracy, EAL um, and pupil premium. That's the most important thing. Now, our disadvantaged students is something that sits quite close to my heart and my role at the City of Leicester College really focuses on the development and the outcomes and the provisions for our most disadvantaged students. So just to give you a bit of context about the City of Leicester College, we are an incredibly diverse inner city school. We have about 11 to, we're an 11 to 19 co-ed school. Um, we have just over about 1,600 students and about 24% of them are from disadvantaged backgrounds. About 55% of them speak English as an additional language with obviously varying proficiencies. And it's definitely a vibrant place to work in. As you can see, about 55 first languages are spoken by our students and about 47 different ethnicities. So it's an absolutely diverse, a really vibrant place to work at. Now, I just wanted to talk about the attainment gap. Now, both nationally, across Leicester City, and uh, within my school, there's always been a disadvantage attainment gap. It's an undeniable fact, and I think like many schools, we've always tried to address the barriers, try and work out what we can do to really bridge the gap. But in all honesty, it's been incredibly challenging to really nail down what can make a difference. Now, if we rewind to 2020 and the COVID pandemic, whilst that was absolutely awful in a plethora of ways, what it really allowed us to do was to hit pause and assess what can make the biggest difference to our student outcomes. Now, we were in an unfortunate position in Leicester City where we were the first city to see an additional citywide lockdown. This meant that our students in Leicester were out of the classroom more so than students nationally. And if you add in the impact of the cost of living crisis, increasing amounts of redundancies and furloughs because of the pandemic, we saw social deprivation within our city, within our school, rise dramatically. But how did this really impact attainment? And that's what myself, in my role, and my school really wanted to focus on. Now, I think it's safe to say that the barriers faced by one disadvantaged student is and can be very different to other disadvantaged students. But what we realized as a school was that our disadvantaged students were more likely to live in multi-generational homes. 
They were more likely to share bedrooms with siblings, family members. They were less likely to have access to working laptops, Wi-Fi, and therefore were less likely to have access to the online learning and the live lessons that were happening during the pandemic. Now, we of course supplied computers, Wi-Fi dongles, printed work, but that was not an adequate replacement for being inside the classroom and all the hours inside the classroom that were missed. We used the pandemic as an opportunity to really review, assess and evaluate our provision for our disadvantaged students. And using evidence-based research, primarily from the Education Endowment Foundation, we really wanted to ensure that our priorities for our disadvantaged students were synonymous with our whole school priorities. So we wanted to focus on the quality of education and really think about what we could do inside the classroom. And we focused on three key areas. We focused on metacognition, literacy, and assessment and feedback. Now that was within the classroom, making sure that all of our students, including our most disadvantaged, had access to the highest quality of education. But outside of the classroom and thinking about that wider academic support, we really wanted to focus on what we could do to provide equity for our students. Because for us at the City of Leicester College, it wasn't about equality, it was about providing a sense of equity for our disadvantaged students. So one of the benefits of the pandemic was the introduction of the National Tutoring Programme. So it was the government's funding for tutoring, and that's where my tutor comes in. So when we first decided to engage with my tutor and really invest, our disadvantaged students, more so than others, had faced huge challenges, both inside and outside the classroom. Some of them had missed their SATs. Some of them hadn't been able to access online learning. Some didn't have access to physical reading books. Some had deteriorating mental health. And above all, they'd missed more than just being inside the classroom. So we decided to really provide our disadvantaged students with one-to-one -one and three-to-one support at Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4. And after conducting an audit of technology, we provided laptops, Wi-Fi dongles, a place for them to work, and we really tried to plug the gaps in their knowledge. We liaised extensively with classroom teachers to identify topics, units, modules, and we really tried to make sure there was a narrative between our classroom teachers, the tutors at my tutors, but most importantly, our parents as well. Now, after engaging with the tutoring for the first year, we wanted to see whether it had an impact on student outcomes, which is the most important thing for our students. Now, we knew it had beneficial aspects in terms of the softer impacts on things like confidence, on things like the ability to believe in themselves, but we wanted to see whether the tutoring had any real bearings on actual attainment. Now, before the pandemic, as you can see up here on the board, our score progress eight was minus 0.18 in 2019. We then had two years of the pandemic and teacher assess grades. And whilst that was a really vigorous process, it's really difficult to assess student outcomes unless you look at actual final GCSE exams. So in 2022, the first year after the pandemic, and also another year that we'd invested in the online tutoring, our school PA shot up to 0.5. Now last year, we know that grade boundaries and exam content went back to 2019 standards. And our school PA last year was 0.31. So it was a slight drop from the year before, but still measuring above the national average. Now it's really difficult to quantify the impact of tutoring as there's a range of interventions, curriculum choices, things happening both inside and outside the classroom that our students are exposed to. But we wanted to see as a whole in terms of our cohort, those that invested and engaged with the online tutoring, the impact that it had. Now for most of our students, those that were relentless with their tutoring made over two to three grades worth of progress from their target grades. And for our disadvantaged students, they made at least half a grade's worth of progress. Now, at a student level, I wanted to talk about PATH. And I wanted to talk about PATH B 
because he sits quite close to my heart. Path was born in India and he arrived from Portugal and did, completed the last couple of years of his primary school study before joining us at the City of Leicester College. Path is a disadvantaged student and he worked absolutely relentlessly to try and overcome the challenges that he was facing. He went through intensive language development intervention to actually acquire the language enough to be able to access the curriculum. And over the course of year 11, he was relentless in working hard, engaging with the online tutoring. He never missed a single day and both inside the lessons worked incredibly hard. And I should know, I taught PATH and I was really happy, but also left enthused by the amount of exam papers and mounds of essays that he'd give to me to mark. Now, Path had a target grade of a four in English and he went on to achieve a grade seven. And for maths, he had a target grade of a grade five and he got a grade eight, which has surpassed all of our expectations. And actually in all of his core subjects, he achieved three grades higher than his target grades. And in the words of Path, the support provided by my tutor was really important as it allowed me and motivated me to achieve grades which I thought I could not obtain. The tutors provide such a unique and fun experience which made me want to keep working hard and ultimately resulted in the results that I got. So I've mentioned our school progress A as well as the impact at a student level, but I also wanted to delve into the attainment for our most disadvantaged. Last year we saw nationally the highest disadvantage gap across the country since 2011. And in 2022, the year after the pandemic, our school, the City of Leicester College, saw the highest disadvantage gap that we've ever seen in our school as well. Now, there's so many factors that have come into play here. The cost of living crisis, the pandemic, but for us last year, or the year before, we saw the highest disadvantage gap, which was actually really disheartening for us. In 2023, after online tutoring, after focusing on high quality teaching inside the classroom, our disadvantaged students, our progress eight was minus 0.15, the narrowest gap we've ever had. So we know that something's working. But what I've learned from leading on pupil premium is that there's a lot out of our control. And we can't unfortunately control the cost of living crisis. We can't control social deprivation in our country in our city but what we can do is control what happens inside our classrooms and really focus on that high quality education for all and in particular for our disadvantaged students it's about providing them with that equity to be able to close that gap and bridge that gap between them and all others and i think that is what will make the biggest difference and finally just to close I truly believe that leading with a learning-led label as opposed to a label-led is what will make a massive difference. Thank you so much. I think you're going to hear a very similar thing really uh, here. Uh, my name is Gary Green. I'm Director of Schools Improvement for uh, Bowen Education Trust. Uh, so we're a multi-academy trust of uh, eight schools and we've done a lot of work supporting other schools with very high levels of disadvantaged. Um, and so much of what Neem has just said absolutely resonates with what we believe and what we've learned. Um, so as I say, we are uh, eight schools. Um, my role within that essentially from about 2019 was to be the kind of strategic lead for disadvantaged across the trust. Um, that was to kind of understand see our children, our disadvantaged children, as a virtual school. So I acted as a head teacher for that virtual school of disadvantaged students. And I came into post, had about th three months, and then a pandemic happened. And I think Nima put it best, we said, you know, somebody put pause button on the system. And my God, what a pause, and what a situation we were in. Um, one of the things I noticed and that will resonate to everyone here, I'm aware we're probably pushing at open doors, is the very perception around disadvantaged. Nimi just talked about becoming experts in children, not labels, and I couldn't speak more about that. That one of the biggest things that we know, we find, and we're having to work through is that very deep 
deficit discourse that exists in our schools with the most caring, wonderful teachers in the world around children and disadvantage and our governors and our, our, our communities. When we talk about disadvantage, the image that always per uh, percolated into people's consciousness is that Dickensian notion of what do we mean by disadvantage. I've sat in meetings where governors or trustees have said things like, well, you know, the reason the disadvantaged kids aren't turning up is their parents are drinking on the sofa. You know, and you think, okay, these are people in positions of huge responsibility that just don't understand. Um, so a huge part of our work and tutoring's place within it has been about the narrative of disadvantage, of equity uh, in our trust. Um, shifting that understanding that we think children don't have ambitions or parents aren't ambitious, parents don't have aspirations. We know that's not true. We know that actually almost all parents are aspirant for their kids. It's the knowledge and the skills that, about realization of that uh, aspiration. So the key has been showing children, seeing things in kids they don't yet see in themselves, seeing things in our staff they don't yet see in themselves. Um, we know about this, the Pygmalion effect, that self-fulfilling prophecy of low expectations that is one of the most fundamental factors that drives disadvantage and that equity gap. We know that high, uh, higher sets are really effective, irrespective of what prior attainment of the kids go into those sets. We know this. Um, so there's so many factors around this. And the thing that I have come back to and used time and time again that everybody in this room is probably fami familiar with is Austin's butterfly. And the way this story is told is to show the progress of a child through iterations of feedback. What you're seeing are six pictures by the same child following feedback by a teacher, oh, and that child is six years old. And when we use this with staff, we ask the staff, how old do you think the kid is at the first, start, first picture? How old is the kid at the end, right? But we're missing the point of Austin's butterfly. The fundamental point of Austin's Butterfly isn't that it's the power of feedback. It's about the power of expectation. That Austin's teacher always knew that Austin would go from there to there. Austin's teacher always believed that Austin had the potential to be there. And we use this with our staff to say, how many kids do you teach that in RE, in English, in maths, in science, in PE, look a bit like that? And have you understood? And how do you see them? And this is the burden of disadvantage. Um, so seeing in children what they don't yet see in themselves. Tutoring has had a big part of our work. It's been a big part of our uh, work. Neem talked about uh, the NTP, and I agree with her that actually this is something, yeah, could have been better. Yeah, there were lots of things that were wrong. Yes, yeah, schools were learning on the hoof very, very quickly. But we have seen some hugely positive things that co have come through National Tutoring Programme. Um, Year one, that looks like 11,000 online lessons across our trust. Uh, that looked like using a number of providers. That looked like uh, a range of providers uh, from lots of different sectors. Um, that also looked like um, uh, some work in schools, but not a huge amount. Year two, that we, we'd evaluated the impact of what we'd done across the piece. We then sort of zeroed in and then expanded as the NTP expanded to bring in school-led tutoring and academic mentors, these kind of rarefied beasts that exist out there somewhere in education, these academic mentors that are gonna descend on our schools and help us, really hard to find. Where we found them, they were amazing, really hard to find. And as we are where we are now is we've moved to a very blended space where we still engage significantly online tutoring for the right kids in the right way at the right time in the right place, uh, but fundamentally more significantly school-led tutoring and you know things like Key Stage 2 specialism. We talk about that transition between Key Stage 2 and 3. Like, <laughs> There, there, there was the, all, all the kind of pandemic did is shone a light on how, how, how important that transition is, that actually we shouldn't be thinking in terms of key stage two and three, and we've sort of removed that barrier in our schools. So I just was going to talk about three lessons that we've learned, three things that we've kind of increasingly focused on to, I think, improve our delivery of how we're doing this, um, and things we learned the hard way. We learned some of this the really hard way by making mistakes. So... The first thing around that is the East Framework stuff, making this as easy as possible to implement. 
What that actually means is in many schools, tutoring was being landed upon a burnt out assistant head that was doing a million other things or a aspirant middle leader that was trying to pull huge levers and chasing attendance and doing some really difficult stuff. And what we had to do was make it really clear that we can put structures around tutoring that enable it to happen. So that was about TLRs for teachers and subjects, pushing the, su the tutoring into the subject. And that was really important, removing it from a person to being something that was part of that every subject did where they did it. Um, I'm going to talk about how we promoted it with students in a minute, but that part being really important, how we were onboarding students, the messages they received about why were they being tutored. Um, a fundamental bit here is most teachers don't actually want you to tutor the kids because no matter what the, we tell them about the certain trust, whatever we tell them about the research, most teachers don't want to know they need someone else's help. Most teachers want to believe, believe it's in them and but they should. But we've had to do a huge amount of work to, to help teachers understand that actually this is team around the child. You know, it takes a village. <laughs> um, this is part of the village. Um, so this mutually enforcing report, uh, approach, I talked about that. This is really critical where something tutoring can suddenly start happening in a silo over here and a silo over there and trying to work through the barriers that was really pushing it into the everyday discourse of leadership, support and intervention in the schools. The second piece of that is about assessment, not assumption. We made too many assumptions about children. We made too many assumptions about, actually, these kids probably want to work at home. These kids probably want to be at school. These children will really engage. And we, we didn't really build that picture. It took us some time to determine, actually, we need to listen to children, listen to staff. We need to spend time putting as much um, importance on quality assuring what's happening in tutoring sessions as anything else that we do. So it's happening in school. Those sessions probably shouldn't be supervised by somebody who doesn't know the kids. Those sessions should probably be supervised by somebody who does really know the kids. If there's somebody in the classroom that is supervising that class and it's, they're a math teacher and they're doing maths, they probably shouldn't be doing tutoring. They should probably have the maths teacher. So these are the sort of things that we worked our way through um, by uh, pulling those things together. And, but the third thing that I wanted to major on was talk about the narrative about how important that bit is. So as I said, most teachers don't want tutoring to help their kids from a good place. It's taken quite a lot of work. So our subject team that across our mat that's been most kind of skeptical has been our maths team. The subject which we absolutely know tutoring's had the biggest impact is maths. <laughs> so we've had quite a lot of work to do to, to, to do that. But the other most important bit is around parents and children is what messages children have received when they say you're being picked up for catch-up tutoring. We want you to come out of this thing that you enjoy to meet somebody online and do more maths. And how we've tried to absolutely normify that in the culture of what we do as a school. Um, Hi, my name's Olivia and I've just... So I'm just going to show you. Um, one of the things we do is uh, for our head teachers have made videos that go out to all of our parents uh, on our websites that essentially say this is tutoring, it's part of the thing we do and this is why we ask your tu uh, kids to partake in tutoring. So we make it high level when we do assemblies, we use these in assemblies, we instruct our children that this is an amazing opportunity that we will give as many of you as we possibly can. Um, I'll just show you this short clip. Hi, my name's Olivia and I've just left Year 11. I've done tutoring in maths and it really helped me because the woman was very friendly. We've done a lot of fractions because I struggled with it and it really helped build my confidence. Hello, my name's Ashton from Year I've just left Year 11 for Bohunt School Worrowing and in Year 11 I was signed up for the action tutoring and my experiences with the tutoring was that it was really good. Um, I got so much out of it. Originally I was dreading going, I didn't think that I'd really enjoy it or I'd get much from having that experience but after the first week um, I really enjoyed it and my tutor was amazing. So hopefully now... So we didn't make those videos for you, those videos were made a couple of years ago for our parents and for our students to understand why from their role models, children hearing it from children within their own stories so they could see the power that it has and families hearing that. Um, that also looked like 
graduation uh, ceremonies for children in our assemblies for kids that have completed tutoring that look like absolutely normifying it as we do anything else within our culture um, across everything that we do. And a big part of this for us has been about acting into new ways of thinking, in finding ways to build into schools, both in terms of systems, in terms of our whole, whole approach, that are developing really good habits of leadership, are developing really good habits of relationality, are developing really good habits in implementation. Um, it's just important to say there also, we did use a number, we found a number of, we worked with a number of tutoring companies, some kids engage far more with a near peer effect of a university student that they could relate to more. Some students, we also work with another group called Action Tutoring, who brought in um, inspirational mentors from business. And for some kids, that was, the abs that is, that was brilliant. That absolutely right. There's nothing works everywhere. Everything works somewhere. So we kept working this through. In terms of impact, what we absolutely know. So what we did, all of our schools essentially um, track all students that have engaged substantially with tutoring, so by which we mean students that have had five or more sessions. Um, we track those as groups that run through all our data systems and we track them through to GCSE and how they did. Um, and what we absolutely know is for disadvantaged children, disadvantaged children made more progress through tutoring as no, than non-disadvantaged. Why? Well, when we spoke to students, it lined up with the national research. Children felt much more, and it's really sad, it's really sad, but children felt much more able to stop and ask for help when they were on their own than they were when they're in front of their peers. Um, and that was the fundamental, that's come through the Sutton Trust research, but it's also what we absolutely heard from our children. We know that in maths, children that received disadvantaged kids that were tutoring, made, uh, tutored, made half a grade more progress across the piece than uh, disadvantaged kids that didn't receive tutoring. We know in English, students that were tutored made equivalent progress to students that weren't tutored. So you'd go, well, okay, that doesn't sound so great, but you don't tend to tutor kids that are on track to make average progress. These were kids that weren't tracking that way at the start. Um, so we tutored about, that's across a body of about 600 children. That wasn't, that was partly my tutor, that's partly action tutoring, it's partly all the other great stuff that we do, that you do, that we're all doing. But something's working. So all of this is about, I think, what our roles are, that inviolable responsibility we have in education, that tutoring is an example of it. But we are ultimately purveyors of hope. That's what teachers do, that's what is upon us, that's our responsibility. And that's what tutoring has enabled us to do within the narratives of our and stories of our schools. Um, thank you very much. Oh, thanks so much, Gary and Nima, for your wonderful advice and wisdom. I think you'll probably be here or just there for a couple of minutes in case anybody has any questions at all. Very happy to answer those. If you're interested in my tutor, um, you can visit our stand at C22. We've, got, we've actually got a tutor there live, ready to talk to anybody if you'd like to have a chat. Um, but thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you found it very helpful. Great, thanks. Um, thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, again, can we just give a round of applause to the panel for everything they've done? Uh, and again, I will just say, as someone who was a, uh, a governor in a school that used my tutor and had the exact same experience as yourselves, this is something I've heard again. So just to reflect that, I think you've given really good uh, feedback on how to use it very, very well. For those of you who are staying, we have another session at 12.50, which is looking at how we use uh, education to navigate mental health, looking at some of the ethics of that and the practicalities of it. So do stay here. If you fancy it, there are two golden tickets for that session as well. Ooh. Uh, if you are leaving us now, I hope you have a wonderful day at the rest of the EdTech Summit. Uh, don't forget our hashtag EdTech Summit and the one I forgot earlier was TikTok. If you fancy making a TikTok, just remember to put the hashtag on there. Thanks very much everyone, see you shortly.